Hope everyone's doing well this morning. On this lovely Saturday morning, June 11th, 2020, 2022. Got to add those last two years on there. We moved way past the worst part of the pandemic, which was in 2020. Thank the good Lord. We're still living with, you know, until it comes to an end, we're still just hanging in there and uh, we're all in this together. We're going to get through it. Welcome to the Elizabeth Sharon Ann Bible study. And I'm Michelle, and I'm excited to be on here this morning with y'all as we dig into the word and just learn new things from God, what he has to say to us. He's a good God. And uh, he's sure good to us every day. And his mercies are new every morning. You know, we got a whole fresh batch of mercies from our Heavenly Father today for this day. And guess what? We'll have a new batch tomorrow too. And every day till he comes back and gets us, his mercies are new. And his love is great. And his faithfulness is great. And he's amazing. Um, so this morning in our Old Testament reading, we are in 1 Kings 8. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant is brought to the temple. And in 1 and 2, all of Israel assembles at Jerusalem. The temple wasn't ready to operate until the Ark of the Covenant was set in the most holy place. The ark was the most important item in the temple. And we've read in the, uh, the few chapters before this about how Solomon had the temple built. I mean, I would love to see a replica of the temple. Um, it just sounds amazing. And God gave the instructions for it. And uh, the it just sounds so beautiful. And um, and so then in three through nine, the Ark of the Covenant is set in the most holy place and nothing was in the Ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb. Of course, those contain the Ten Commandments. Um, at an earlier point in Israel's history, there were three items in the Ark of the Covenant, the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. We don't know what happened to the golden pot of manna and Aaron's rod, but they were not in the ark when Solomon set it in the most holy place. And then in 10 through 13, the glory of God fills the temple. I think that's so, so beautiful. Just thought of that. Let's read that. When the priests came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. You know, that was, oh, it had to have been an amazing sight. And just the feeling of it, you know, just to be part of that, wow. Wow. Then Solomon prayed, O oh Lord, you have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. And then in 14 through 21, Solomon's speech at the dedication of the temple, who spoke with his mouth to my father David and with his hand has fulfilled it. Solomon recognized that the temple was the fulfillment of God's plan more than David's or Solomon's. David and Solomon were human instruments, but the work was God's. And then in 22 through 23, Solomon recognizes the nature and character of God. The Old Testament posture of prayer was tradi traditionally to set out the hands toward heaven or spread out the hands toward heaven. 
in a gesture of surrender, openness, and ready reception. And uh, let's read that, 22 through 23. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel. He lifts his hands toward heaven and he prayed, O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven above or on the earth below. You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. He still does today and he always will. And, uh, and then in 24 through 26, Solomon recognizes God as the maker and keeper of his promise. God sent the promise on purpose to be used. If I see a Bank of England note, it is a promise for a certain amount of money, and I take it and use it. But oh, I, my friend, do try and use God's promises. Nothing pleases God better than to see his promises put in circulation. He loves to see his children bring them up to him and say, Lord, do as thou hast said. And let me tell you that it glorifies God to use his promises. And that's a quote from Spurgeon. And in 27 through 30, Solomon asked God to dwell in this place and honor those who seek him there, here. Let's see, 27 through 30. But will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O Lord, my God. Hear the cry and prayer that your servant is making to you today. May you watch over this temple night and day and this place where you have said, my name will be there. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest request from me and your people, Israel, when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live, and when you hear, forgive. Praise God. He hears us from heaven, and he, when he hears us, he forgives us. Um, when you hear, forgive. Solomon knew that the most important thing Israel needed was forgiveness. This was the greatest answer to prayer Israel could expect from God. And then in 31 through 32, hear when your people take an oath at the temple. Solomon asked the God who can see what man can't, who knows the hidden heart of the man, to enforce from heaven the oaths made at the temple. And in 33 through 34, hear when your people are defeated. God forgives and restores his defeated people when they come in humble repentance. And so Solomon's asking God for all of these things in advance, that when his people come to him, when he, when, when Solomon and God's people come to God in prayer, you know, they're going to be asking all kinds of things of the Lord, just like we all do. And uh, you know, he was asking for forgiveness and um, to, for God to hear when the people take an oath at the, of, at the temple and uh, hear when your people are defeated. And so, you know, whenever they go out to in, in war, you know, if they are ever defeated, God forgives and restores his defeated people when they come in humble repentance. He always does. He is a God of restoration and a God of multiplication. Um, and in 35 through 40, here in times of plague and famine, because we know those times come too. And drought was a constant threat for the agriculturally based econo economy of Israel. If there was no rain, there was no food. 
Solomon recognized some plagues were easily seen, but other plagues come from our own heart. Many are cursed by a plague that no one else can see, but lives or, or but lives in their own heart. Solomon asks God to answer such a plague-stricken man when he humbly pleads at the temple. A great many men think they know the plague of other people's hearts. And there is a great deal of talk in the world about this family and that person and the other. I pray you let the scandals of the hour alone and think of your own evils. And that's a Spurgeon quote. And then in 41 through 43, Solomon asks, when a foreigner prays that God would hear the foreigner, Solomon knew that when God mercifully answered the prayers of foreigners, it drew those from other nations to the God of all nations. Praise God. Then in 44 through 53, here when Israel goes out into battle and prays from captivity and um, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, you know, when, when men fall and uh, God can restore. And uh, in 54 through 61, Solomon blesses the people of Israel. And uh, 1 Kings 8.22 tells us that Solomon began this prayer standing. But sometime before he finished, he fell to his knees in reverence of God. And Ezra prayed on his knees in Ezra 9 through 5. The psalmist called us to kneel, Psalm 95 through 6. Daniel prayed on his knees, Daniel 6, 10. Um, Stephen prayed on his knees, Acts 7, 16. We're going to talk more about Stephen here in the New Testament scriptures. Peter prayed on his knees, Acts 9, 40. Paul prayed on his knees, Acts 20, 36. And other early Christians prayed on their knees, Acts 21, 5. Most importantly, Jesus prayed on his knees, Luke 22, 41. The Bible has enough prayer, not on the knees, to show us that it isn't required, but it also has enough prayer on the knees to show us that it is good. So when we pray, you know, we can be standing or kneeling. We can even bow before the Lord in reverence when we pray. And he hears our prayer and he hears the cries of our hearts. And then in 62 through 66, the Feast of Dedication for the Temple. The Feast of Tabernacles was in itself a grand occasion for rejoicing and for an enhanced spirit of community among all Israelites. The dedication of the temple made this occasion all the more joyful and memorable. And the time of the celebration was suitably extended. And that's a quote by Patterson and Austell. So it was a beautiful time uh, the, when uh, Solomon dedicated the temple and a uh, very special, special time. And then in Acts uh, 7, uh, 51 through 8, 13 um, is our New Testament reading. And uh, excuse me for a second. My daughter's little kitten decided to join me this morning. She's not on the camera, but I can see her from here. I think she's got to jump down. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see here. Stephen applies the sermon to his listeners. So in the previous chapter, you know, Stephen um, went through, you know, the history of the ancestors and how, uh, you know, all of the glorious things God did, you know, um, and he was telling this to the ones who had, a, a, you know, were trying to harm him uh, for preaching about Jesus, the religious leaders. And he takes the sharp knife of the word and rips up the sins of the people. 
laying open the inward parts of the, their hearts and the secrets of their soul. He could not have delivered that searching address with greater fearlessness had he been assured that they would thank him for the operation. The fact that his death was certain had no other effect upon him than to make him yet more zealous. And that's a Spurgeon quote. And so, you know, he knew, Stephen knew, you know, he was, he ended up being the first martyr for Jesus. And uh, he was speaking the word boldly. He was being a bold witness. And, uh, and, they were cut to the heart in, in verse 54 and convicted by the Holy Spirit. The council was angry because Stephen's message had hit the target. They could not dismiss or ignore what he said. The Sanhedrin reacted with rage instead of submission to the Holy Spirit. And then uh, Stephen's vision of Jesus. Let's read that 55 through 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hands. And, uh, and then the, the execution of Stephen by stoning. And I just want to say that what I just read is so beautiful and powerful. I mean, when we're going through persecution, we know who is on our side. And we know that he loves us. And he's the Lord of heaven's armies. And we are his. We are in the palm of his hand. He, Nobody could ever snatch us out of the palm of God's hands. And uh, there were distinguished older men behaving this way. Their reaction seems extreme, but is typical of those who reject God and are lost in spiritual insanity. So they were, it talks about in verse 57. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. I mean, you know, you just think of, you know, the little kids that, la, 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 la. you know, they were just trying, and they're grown men, dignified men, uh, and acting this way. And it was all because they didn't want to know the truth. Sadly, they were rejecting the truth, and uh, they didn't want to hear about Jesus. But Jesus is who they needed the most, and that's who we all need the most. And uh, they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. So they, his accusers took off their coat and laid, laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we know that Saul <coughs> was... Uh, you know, he persecuted Christians before he uh, got saved, and uh, God turned his life completely around. And, uh, and so, um, Stephen's last words, 59 through 60, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. And that's what Jesus said to uh, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do when they killed Jesus and or when when um, Jesus laid down his life for us. And uh, and then in Acts eight, the church is persecuted and scatters. A great persecution arose against the church. Stephen's death was only the beginning. The floodgates of persecution were now open against the Christians. Saul was one was only one of many persecutors of Christians. And then the burial of Stephen is in verse two of, of Acts eight, and then three through four. Saul continues his persecution. The church was scattered. In every church, there is really the power. 
of the Spirit of God. The Lord will cause it to be spread abroad, more or less. He never means that a church should be like a nut shut up in a shell, nor like ointment enclosed in a box. The precious perfume of the gospel must be poured forth to sweeten the air. And that's a beautiful quote from Spurgeon. And so these believers were scattered because of the persecution, and they went about uh, continuing to preach the gospel to others um, and to, to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. And uh, in five through eight, Philip brings the gospel to the Samaritans. There was deep seated prejudice, almost hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. You know, we remember about uh, Jesus talking about the good Samaritan. Uh, you know, there was even, you know, there, there was just for, uh, for the longest, it was just, a, just almost a hatred between the two. But in, in that account, uh, the good Samaritan was the one that stopped and helped the man who had been robbed and beaten. And, uh, and then yet Philip preached Christ to them. Because Jesus had worked in him, there was no room for this kind of prejudice in his heart or mind. He wasn't a racist towards the Samaritans. And then in 9 through 13, Simon the sorcerer believes. In the Bible, sorcery is associated with the occult and magical practice. Whatever real power Simon had, it was not from Satan, but God. And amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done, Simon was convinced by Philip's preaching and amazing miracles to the point where he declared belief, was baptized, and continued with Philip. So uh, Simon the sorcerer was saved, and uh, praise God, God was moving his mighty hand, and he still is today. And I believe that we are going to see a mighty outpouring of his spirit in this dark world and uh, that he will have his way. He's in control. It might not look like it, but he is in control every day. And it doesn't matter what's going on around us. God is still God. He will always be God. And he will always be in control. Praise God. We just need to keep praying that his spirit and welcoming his spirit in, this, in the land we live in. And that he would save our family members who don't know him, our friends who don't know him. And that God would draw people into our churches all around the country, around the nation. And he would move upon people's hearts with, with the Holy Spirit, and they would receive him because he is, like I said, he is our only hope. And then um, in Psalm 129, 1 through 8, a song of pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. But the Lord is good, in verse 8. He has cut me free from the ropes of the ungodly. Um, you know, he, he does that. He will cut us free from the ropes of the ungodly. We are his always, always his. And um, when we press in to him, we grow stronger. When we wait upon the Lord, we grow stronger. He promises us that they who wait upon the Lord, he would renew our strength. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. We will mount up on wings like eagles. And, you know, there's also the scripture that says, he makes my feet as hinds feet, you know, like the feet of a deer. Oh, there goes the little kitty again. <laughs> my phone's kind of She's shaking the table here. So um, he is good and his mercy endures forever and ever. From this day forth, 
and to a thousand generations. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. He is our deliverer. He's our rock. He's our fortress. He is our strong tower. He is our hiding place. And we hide and rest under the shadow of his wings, just like a mother hen covers up her little chicks, brings them in. We hide under the shadow of his wings. He gives us protection. He gives us strength. He is everything that we have need of every day. And he always will be. And uh, our wisdom nugget for today, Proverbs 17, 1. Better a dry crust eaten in peace than a house filled with feasting and conflict. And that is so true. You know, you think about that. You know, um, just sitting there eating in peace, eating peacefully. And uh, that is so much better than, um, you know, just all this strife happening around you. You know, you just imagine it. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to. Uh, be in, uh, hey, no, <laughs> oh, this cat. I tried to put the cat uh, in the bathroom for about 30 minutes while I do this Bible study, but I couldn't catch her <clears throat> this morning. So she's a fast one, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, that brings us to the close of today. Oh, I don't know what. Oh my goodness. Um, and I hope that everyone has a good day and enjoys the rest of your weekend and uh, just go forth in God's blessings and, and uh, enjoy the life that God has given us. And be blessed. Have a good day, y'all. Bye-bye. See you next time.